Well, for those of you who have joined already, we want to welcome you to our 2022nd Nature Lecture Series. Um, we're very excited about it, and it's sponsored by the Bloomfield Leisure Services and the Wintonberry Land Trust of Bloomfield. And if you'd like to visit our website, you can do that at wintonberrylandtrust.org. It's very simple, and Matt will put it in the... Um, the chat box just for you to see. And the reason I'm saying this because we offer trails. And if you would like to take a hike, this is a great time of the year when it's not wet and raining, or even when it's snowing, you can go for, uh, you can go uh, cross country skiing, you can go, um, you know, using um, shoes, snowshoes. And so on our website, we have all the trails listed. We have maps so you can find out where they're located. And they're very simple. They're easy to get to, and they're all in Bloomfield. And so we welcome you for that. And um, just to mention that this Fisher uh, Mammals are the first of five lectures of this year. Um, all our webinars are on the first Wednesday of every month through May. And coming up next month is on February 2nd, Groundhog Day, not a groundhog, but we're having a talk on bald eagles. Uh, March 2nd, beavers. April 6th, the importance of bees. And on May 4th, bats. And so it should be an interesting time. Um, you can, si we'll have, uh, you can sign up right, Matt, um, anywhere on your site. Oh, here you're up. Yep. Here's the Here's announcement. Yep, this is the bald eagles is uh, coming up for next month. And uh, um, if you go to the Bloomfield, um, uh, bloomfieldrec.com, um, that flyer will be up there uh, by tomorrow uh, with all of the upcoming webinars um, that are going on. Okay, and you can also go to the Wittenberry Land Trust website and go to events. And we also list all the uh, uh, events coming up, all of the webinars, and you can sign in there and register there also. And also note that we are recording tonight so that if you should miss it or you have a friend who you'd like to share it with, um, sometime next week it will appear on the Wittenberry Land Trust YouTube site. So um, Matt, I think that's it. Um, do you want to say anything else? Um, no, uh, we're just, we're really excited, like Sharon said, to have everybody ba uh, back this year. It was, uh, it was a great success last year um, over the series of webinars that we had, and our, our audience just kept growing and growing, and uh, already we've, uh, we're, we're doing pretty well with, uh, with 63 people that have come in, and we're just happy to be able to offer this, uh, this programming at this time. So, um, like I said, we'll get that uh, information out to you about the upcoming webinars, and hopefully you'll be able to join us um, for those. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and introduce our presenter for this evening. Um, our presenter is Mr. Richard Taylor. Um, he is a retired human resources executive. He has a past passion for education and continuous learning, and has served as the chief learning officer, a member of the Federal Committee on Apprenticeship, and Rhode Island Vocational Council and has degrees in executive certifications from SCSU, RPI, and Cornell. Richard has had an interest in wildlife and fishing his entire life. Since his retirement, he completed Connecticut's Master Wildlife Conservationist Program and is now active volunteering and presenting programs on uh, wildlife to libraries and nonprofit organizations. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Richard and uh, we'll get started. Thanks for joining us, folks. Thank you, Matt. And I'd like to thank the sponsors, the Wintonberry Land Trust, as well as the Bloomfield Leisure Services. Um, I'm gonna take control of the screen, and then I'm gonna go to right here. Okay. So first thing I want to do is make sure that everyone understands after attending today's talk is that it's a fisher, it's not a fisher cat. And I'm going to talk to you about how I think we ended up with fisher cat. And there's even hockey teams named fisher cat uh, in New England. So 
First, we'll get to, um, as I get a little farther into the talk, I'll talk a little bit about that. But the, what you could see, this is a picture, and this is taken by Paul Rigo. He's a wildlife biologist with the uh, Department of Wildlife, the DEEP uh, team. Um, and you can see from the, this picture uh, of, the, of the fisher that uh, the back of the fisher, the tail portion, of the, has a very long uh, uh, tail, has a slender body, and the short legs, and they're very elongated. Um, and they have a very bushy tail. It's usually lighter in the front, uh, lighter color in the front. Sometimes they're even a little bit grizzly looking in the front. But uh, if you've ever seen a fisher running, the, the tail is almost as long as the body. Now, some of the fisher, um, and I'm going to show you a picture a little later, have a white patch on the chest. Uh, so it's, if you see one uh, coming toward you and you want to one, if you're wondering what that is, that's, that's a fisher that they just have, some of them have the white patch. They also uh, vary in color where the males appear, appear darker and more grizzly in appearance than the females often are lighter. Now the, the uh, fishers are members of the weasel family, and that's the mustelid family. Uh, the polecat, the badger, the marten, otter, wolverine, and then other weasel members uh, make up that family. Worldwide, there are over 50 species, 23 genera, and eight subfamilies. Uh, in the weasel family. So it's not a fisher cat, it's a fisher. This program has been put together by the deep wildlife team and I've added a few slides uh, of my own in here, but and we'll look as we go through. Let's get my... So this is a female that you're looking at right here. You can see she's a little bit lighter and a little bit smaller. Now the fisher, uh, the name was thought to have come from the early American immigrants who noted the animal's resemblance to the European polecat, and they would call that the fishette, the fish, or the fishu. In some of the aboriginal languages, of the, uh, they called the fisher the pecan, pequam, and the weejack, uh, as well as the woolang. Now, if you, look, if you look at the Latin name at the top of the slide, uh, the Latin name of that is named Panani, and that is named for Thomas Pennant, who first described the fisher in the, in the United States in 1771. So now I'm gonna to get to a little bit of the history of how I think we arrived at the fisher cat name. Um, the English translations of the Native American legends, some of the legends that were told over the years, um, they referred to the fisher as black cats, also black foxes. And there was a chief of the Cherokee uh, named Chief Black Fox, his name was Inoe, and that name translated means fisher. So it's pretty understandable if, if you look at some of the legends of the Native Americans, uh, they referred to the fisher as black cats. So it's pretty easy to figure out how we ended up with the term or with the name fisher cats. Is that, so that goes back many, many years uh, with the founding of the country. Now this is a picture of a fisher in, enclosed in a plexiglass case. And this is up at Sessions Woods in Burlington. If you ever have a chance to go there, I, I would recommend you do that. Uh, and you can see again, uh, as I was describing, the fisher ta the tail of the fisher is almost as long as the body. And this is a large male, uh, in what you're looking at here. Fisher lived to be about 10 years of age, either in the wild or in captivity. Uh, and both sexes reach maturity their first year. Uh, at most mate their second year. Now the males, range from four to 12 pounds, and the females are about half that size. So females probably three to six pounds. Uh, the males are 37 inches long to 48 inches. And again, the tail makes up a, a large part of that. And the females are only 30 to 37 inches uh, long. Now this is the geographic range of the fisher. Um, and one of the reasons that I've asked Matt to hold the questions until the end is because this slide to get was put together about five years ago. And this was put together by the deep wildlife team. I was presenting a program in Milford, Connecticut, and there was a lady in the audience. I, I allowed questions during the talk, which wasn't a good idea, I, I later learned. But she was looking up where Fisher could be found in the United States. And of course, now that Fisher can be found where they sh were sh shown in green on this map, but the fisher has also made its way into New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. 
So as I was showing her this map, she was questioning uh, why I didn't sh show the correct map. So that's why we hold the questions until the end now, because we actually got off on quite a uh, discussion at that point. Now, like all, all wildlife, or actually all living uh, creatures, they require habitat to be successful. Uh, so the four basic habitat requirements are food, water, shelter, and space. And the fisher will range widely in search of food. Some will travel up to 60 miles on a hunting foray, but they regularly travel about 10 to 20 square miles looking for food. And they don't defend their home range like uh, some other animals do. Now, fishers, if you haven't seen one it's before, it's probably because they're crepuscular. And what that means is the most active at sunrise and sunset, but they primarily are out uh, walking the woods at nighttime. So that's why you typically will not see them. Now, the other elements of, of what the fish require is space and cover. And the, um, in the fisher habitat, typically a fisher is looking for a habitat that is low to mid elevation environments such as carnivorous forests, mixed conifer forests, or hardwood forests. But they like large trees because they use those large trees for dens. And also there's a lot of animals that, that live in large trees such as squirrels. Um, in the picture of this squirrel poking his head out of a, a white oak, um, if, a, if a fisher sees a squirrel in a hole like that, they will actually climb the tree and tear apart uh, the, the, the decaying tree to get at the animal. Um, so they're a very effective hunter and they also use hollow trees, logs, rocky outcrops, old porcupine dens, root masses, brush piles. Uh, all of those are used for den sites and also for hunting areas. And one thing about fishers, they may actually over harvest the prey in their territory. So it's not uncommon to see fisher for a while. And then you'll probably see a lot fewer squirrels in your area. And then you don't see the fisher after that. So they will pretty much clean out the, um, the animals in the area. Uh, and then they'll move on because they've, they've, they've eaten all the, the prey that they, they can get to. Now this is a, a picture of a young fisher. Uh, in a tree, and this picture was taken by Paul Fusco, and he's a works for the Wildlife Department in Connecticut, the DEEP team. Uh, fishers depend heavily on tree cavities, um, and they use them for shelter and also for raising their young. And they typically have dens twenty to thirty feet off the ground, so they're they're not on the ground; they're up in the trees. And they also can are very good swimmers. Um, and they also climb trees uh, a little bit faster than a squirrel. But the majority of the time that they spend is on the ground searching for food. And in fact, fishers have the ability to rotate their hind paws almost 180 degrees and can climb down a tree head first, just like a squirrel can. Now, fishers are omnivores, which means they eat both plants and animals. And they especially love beech nuts. And because they're in the woods, they love to eat squirrels. They also will eat rabbits, mice, voles, shrews, uh, carrion or roadkill, or if an animal is killed by a predator in the woods, they will scavenge on that. They'll eat fruits, mass, which is uh, beech nuts primarily. And they also are one of the two animals that actually attack and eat porcupines, as well as birds and frogs. Um, so that prim primarily makes up their diet. Now the fishers will kill small prey by simply crushing them in their mouth, like a mouse or a chipmunk uh, or a, a bird, or they'll shake them violently, or they'll simply eat them, eat them and swallow them whole. If it's a larger play, prey, such as a rabbit or a squirrel, they will bite them um, continuously on the head or neck until the animal dies. And then they'll eat the entire animal, bones, fur and all. Um, and if, this, if it's a larger animal, they may leave some small bones or some of the larger bones rather, but they have incredibly strong jaws. So chewing up bones is not a problem for a fisher. Now, some other things that they eat, um, as I mentioned, apples and, um, and porcupines, uh, the, but the juvenile fishers will focus over on, on the left, the apples, because they're not really skilled at hunting. 
So they do a lot of, they consume a lot of fruit early in their, early in their lives, um, especially up to about one year. And once they master hunting, then they, they go on to eat more animals. But the vegetation uh, is especially consumed in the spring and summer months. Now, fishers are also known to cache their prey. And what that means is they, they hide it and they cover it up with leaves uh, if they can't consume the animal in one sitting. Uh, if so, if, if you look at the size of a porcupine, porcupine's actually larger than a fisher. Uh, so once they kill the porcupine, they'll eat for a while and they may come back several times until they finish, um, finish the porcupine. Now they'll also kill if, if an unfortunate situation happens where a deer is hit by an automobile and dies in the woods, the fisher will eat the, the uh, will scavenge on the, the deer and actually bed down in, near that area and continue to feed on it until, it's con until the uh, deer is gone. Now these are acorns, which we have lots of in Connecticut. And this is another one of the hard mass that they eat. Uh, now when a fisher is looking for their territory, uh, they first search for patches of abundant or vulnerable prey and other uh, food like the hard mass, like the acorns here or the beech nuts. And then once they get into that, that area that they, they find that their territory, they will start to zigzag within that patch in search of food and they'll travel in a straight line if they're going from one territory to another. So when you get snow, this is a great time to look for um, fisher tracks. If you see it, the tracks of a fisher going straight, you know it's going from one part of the territory to the other. If it's doing a zigzag through the forest, then you know it's actually hunting and sniffing out uh, the scent of animals. Now, a fisher will travel many miles along ridges in search of prey. And uh, they also will seek shelter in hollow trees or logs or rock crevices or even the dens of other animals. Now, this is a picture uh, uh, by Grant Dupeel, and he takes pictures for the um, Department of Wildlife in Connecticut. This is a picture of, as I said before, uh, one of the few animals or predators that eat uh, porcupines is the fisher. Um, now the other one is the cougar. And so those are the two that, that used to, cougar used to be in Connecticut, and some people claim that they have spotted cougar today in Connecticut. Uh, but the way the fisher attacks the, uh, the uh, porcupine is it circles the animal and lashes out at its head continuously and bites at it. If the porcupine seeks refuge in a tree, uh, the, the fisher will climb up the tree and try to knock the, the porcupine out of the tree and continue to, to uh, attack the porcupine. Once the porcupine dies from bleeding to death, and it's a pretty gruesome sight to see a, uh, a fisher take on a little bit larger animal. Uh, once the animal is dead, the fisher will flip it over and will eat it from its unprotected belly. And it generally takes a fisher about 25 to 30 minutes to kill a porcupine. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and this is a kind of a, I, th I think it's a, it's a story that people think if you walk by a porcupine, that the porcupine can shoot its quills out at you, almost like an arrow. Um, the, quish, the porcupine uh, quills are actually hair that are on the, on the porcupine. They will deliver the quills to the fisher in self-defense, but they seldom cause infections to the fisher or, or other complications. Because one, this is an interesting thing about the quills, they're actually covered with a thin layer of fatty acid that are antibacterial. So they don't infect, they're certainly not comfortable to have a porcupine quill in you. And if you've had a dog with them in their face, uh, you can attest to the, the pain that a dog will, will go through trying to remove them. But they generally don't cause any infection just from the quill itself. Now in the 1950s, the logging companies in New England, with the permission from each state, reintroduced fishers into Northern New England to control the porcupine population. Now at that time, the porcupines were decimating the seedling population that were planted by the timber companies to reestablish uh, trees in a logged area. Now, I want to do a close up of a porcupine quill. This is uh, a, a zoom up, zoom picture of a porcupine quill. You can see if this point goes into your skin, very similar to the, uh, a hook, a hook of a, a barb on a hook of a fishing hook. It, once this 
pushes into some flesh and you can see as, as it pulls out, it's gonna do some scraping and, and damaging the skin. So this is a, zoomed in quite a ways from uh, a porcupine quill. Now, the other thing I wanna talk a little bit about is the um, fisher's foot, because now that we're getting into winter, uh, you may see uh, tracks in the, on the snow and this will help you identify the fisher tracks. The fisher's foot has five digits, as you can see here. The front foot's pad is C-shaped and it curves away from the toes. The, the heel pad sometimes shows the track impression of the front claw. And a lot of animals, when they walk, when they put the front foot down and they start to, to pick up the front foot to go in, in a forward direction, the back foot will step almost directly into the print of the front foot. So it's tough to distinguish the rear print from the front track, but that's, that's sometimes, uh, if you see the tracks and they're kind of, they're kind of smudged together. That's usually what's happening. Now, if you, um, just, just a quick note on the fisher claws. The fisher claws on their foot are visible, as you can see from these track, from this sketch. Um, but the, um, the claws are visible. The fishers hunt by zigzagging through areas of, of thick, regenerated forest vegetation, often looking for rabbits. So if you see a fisher track zigzagging around the snow or if, the substrate, if it's in a mucky or muddy area, you can see the tracks. If you see the, those nail prints up at the front of the track that looks like this, then there's a good chance that you're, you are following a fisher track. Now this picture from hen cam, you can see how uh, over to the, actually each one of these tracks you can see, it looks like the prints are uh, one foot on top of the other. That just shows uh, what, I was, um, what I was talking about before. The other thing that's interesting with the fisher and how they keep track of each other is there's a circular patch of hair on the central pad of, of the fisher's foot, uh, of, of their hind paws, and that's actually a plantar gland. And that gives off a very distinctive odor, and it's believed that the fisher use those to communicate during reproduction periods. Um, and the feet are very large, and those five, they have five retractable, but not sheathed. Uh, claws. Now, what also, if you happen to be looking for fisher tracks and you happen to come upon some scat, um, uh, the other thing that you'll look at is fisher scat is very similar to mink. Well, what, what if you don't know what mink scat looks like? So we're going to go over that for a second. The fisher usually kills much larger animals than, than a mink. So there's going to be coarser hair in the scat. Uh, and it's also not as tightly packed as a mink. And the fisher have regular areas in which they travel to and, to and from their hunting grounds. So if you all, also, if you see a, a stump or a scent post, it's usually a broken piece of wood or, or something where they rub against that scent post and they leave a scent uh, for other fisher, especially uh, during the mating season or uh, where other animals, if they don't want to deal with a fisher, they will pick up the scent uh, from the scent glands that they rub against these uh, pointy stumps on these small trees. Now the comparison of the two scats, the mink scat is long and twisted resembling braided rope. It's black to light in color. I'll just, I'll just read this. With tapered ends and may fold over itself. They may have small bones, fur, feathers, and even fish because mink do eat fish. Uh, so you may see fish bones or scales in the mink scat. And typically mink leave droppings as a signpost on or near rocks or stumps. Uh, so they, it's almost like they're announcing where they're doing their droppings. Now the fisher scat looks similar to a mink, but it's a larger diameter. It's also brown to black in color, and it's kind of a twisted, it's twisted with tapered ends, three quarter, three eighths of an inch to five eighths. So it's fairly small. Um, and since the fisher are main predators of porcupines, you'll also see evidence of quills in the scat. So those are two ways you can pick out the differences. I also want to talk about um, a fisher, again, as I said, a male is four to 14 pounds. That's not a very big animal to take on some of the, the uh, animals that they take on and do very well in, in defeating. So they're a very uh, formidable predator. But like most male, mammal carnivores, they have large, sharp canine teeth. They use those for stabbing and holding, and their molars are used for shearing and crushing. And the carnassal molars, and I'm gonna show you a slide in a second to highlight those, they're the most specialized uh, with 
with carnivores, but highly specialized with fisher. And they are very well adapted for cutting or shearing with scissor-like scissor movement. And the fisher has a total of 38 teeth. But these carnassal molars, can, you can see the ones highlighted in red here. Uh, they, they will do a very good job of crushing bones of uh, small animals, uh, raccoons or porcupines or, or just about anything uh, are easily consumed by a fish. Uh, so they also breed in, they breed in April. Uh, the next slide. This is a very interesting um, process. They have a thing called delayed implantation. Uh, so they will breed in April and they, that, that delayed implantation. If you look at this slide, you'll see um, they mate in April over on the right uh, bottom corner where it says mating in the, in the kind of light pinkish color. They'll mate in April and then the uh, delayed implantation of the fertilized egg goes all the way until February. And then once we get to February, the, that egg that it's remained dormant for 10 to uh, 11 months, then begins to implant in the uterine wall and they and begins their development. Now the gestation period is only about 30 days. So one in one week after the, the female gives birth, um, she will breed again. And as we said before, the female territories often overlap with male fisher territory. So she will, as soon as she gives birth, she will be out to breed again. As I said before, uh, most sexes become sexually mature at about one year of age, but the breeding usually begins in year two. Now in Connecticut, we formerly had gray wolves uh, until the late 1700s and mountain lions, uh, and there were bounties placed on these. So as we uh, uh, changed the landscape in Connecticut and cleared a lot of the forest land out and killed the, these two top predators, uh, the fisher no longer had a predator in the state. But we did other things by like clearing the forest land uh, and that's what happened in the, in the, between the 1600s and late 1800s. Uh, we have pretty much uh, trapped or killed all the fisher from the state. So uh, the Connecticut decided uh, that they were gonna bring fisher back into, because that was really, um, the, the fisher used to be native to Connecticut. So in the 19th century, the fisher became so scarce that for due to logging, log clearing and agriculture um, and over exploitation, they were extirpated as I, as I had mentioned. But as we started to reforest the state of Connecticut and we started to change our land uses where we used to have lots of farms in the state, we now restored this forest habitat. So it allowed the fisher to uh, actually do well in the state back in its historic range. So that allowed the fisher to, um, the population begin to recolonize, re recolonize in the Northeastern part of the state those fisher made their way down from northern New England through Massachusetts, and they could be found in northeastern Connecticut. But for some reason, they were not in the northwestern part of the state. So what Connecticut did is, this is a team that was involved in the project. Um, what they did is they had a project to reintroduce the fisher to the native, its native uh, parts of Connecticut. So what they did is initiated a deep wildlife division initiative, and they gathered funds uh, by taking money from the reimbursement of wild turkeys. We caught turkeys and we gave them to Maine and Maine paid us for those. And then the money we used for that, for the, for the turkeys, we gave to cooperating trappers in New Hampshire and Vermont. And what they did is they, they gave us fishers that were live trapped and they, they began to put them into the state of Connecticut. And I'll, I'll describe how, how all that works. So this is... Um, it's kind of, uh, this is a process known as a soft release where they, they bring a fisher in and they put it in a holding pen, which I'm gonna show you. And they put that holding pen into the area they're gonna release it. But this is a picture of a immobilized fisher in a holding box. And this is Paul Rigo who, is, who took that picture at the front of the presentation. He's examining the fisher here to make sure it's healthy. And then you, you see here, he's gonna take a blood sample from the fisher to make sure there are no diseases. Um, and during this time, they also will pull a tooth uh, to determine the age of the fisher. Now, this is the soft release cages uh, that were up at Sessions Woods. And uh, inside that little box is where the fisher will stay during the daytime. At night, it will come out. And it, it begins to um, 
kind of take in its environment and, and picks up the sense of, the, of everything in its area. And then what they do is they will load these on trucks and they brought them to um, Cornwall, Connecticut, where they released a number of fisher in the state of Connecticut. And this is a truck, uh, stake body trucks that were, that were um, where they're gonna move the fisher to those locations. And then you can see here, they pulled up the top and the fisher ran off into the woods. So this, that's kind of how the process worked in the, in the northwestern part of the state and the population of Fisher is doing very well in the state uh, as of today. So how do you track the Fisher? Well, this is Paul Rigo again, putting a radio collar on the Fisher. And these are customized uh, collars, so they, will, uh, they adjust them just to be perfect fit for the Fisher so they can track the movement um, through radio tracking and also snow tracking uh, the biologist will, will find out where the, where the fisher is traveling to in the state. Now you can see here, this is a close up of the, of the fisher. Um, and this is a, a male fisher. And you can see that they, uh, this collar is fitted pretty tightly to them. These are the days where the collars would pretty much stay on the animal their whole life. Uh, the collars they're using today, especially in the Bobcat uh, program, are uh, programmed to drop off. Um, so it's, it's a little bit easier on the animal after a year it drops off. So this is the old technology, the radio telemetry, and they used a radio transmitter and antennas. And they literally drove around in station wagons to pick up signals of the fissure that were released in the northwestern part of the state. And that allowed them kind of to track them. And then they'd get out on foot with, holding these antennas to try to figure out exactly where the fissure uh, were located. Obviously the technology has come a long way today. Uh, but it, we don't have this kind of old technology. So now I'm gonna tell you a little story about a female fisher. Uh, this is a female fisher released. She's crossing the road. Uh, she was originally released in March of 1990. And, and when, again, as I mentioned, they, they take a tooth from the, the fisher. So they aged her at about three years old when she re was released in, to Connecticut. Now this me next map I've created will show you how far she traveled in the northwest corner of the state. So look to the center of the map and you'll see where the start in Cornwall and that, that she traveled through Warren into Washington and then reverse course and then back up into Cornwall and then made and then went east through Goshen, Winchester and Bark Hampstead, then from Bark Hampstead to Winchester and then from Winchester down to Washington again and then from Washington into Roxbury. Now you can imagine being a wildlife biologist during the 19, early 1990s, driving around with a station wagon, trying to pick up little beeps of where the fisher is located through all of these towns in the Northwest corner was, was not an easy task. Um, so anyway, they tracked all of her movements throughout these areas. And then finally, in the spring of 1991, about a year after she was released, they tracked her to a den um, using their portable antenna and, and receiver. And then they, the biologists climbed up in the tree and they looked inside the den. They found three um, baby fishers, three little kits uh, were seen in, that, in, the, uh, in the den. Now, after that, that interaction, her radio collars um, had died and she was later found deceased in, in May of 1996. So again, I said before, they lived to be about 10 years old. Uh, when we released her in 1990, she was three, and then in 1996, so she was about nine years old when she passed. But I just wanted to show you that the, the kind of tracking that is involved in these programs. Mm. Now the trapping, people will say, well, or now you don't have um, cougars or you don't have wolves in here. Why would you, why would you bring Fisher back into the state? You know, how do you maintain control of them? Because the population could get out of control. So one of the things that um, that the wildlife biologists have to institute is trapping programs. And they, I'm just gonna uh, read this uh, if you will. Uh, the trapping helps to maintain the fur bear populations at sustainable, harvestable, scientifically determined and socially acceptable levels. Now we don't want the fisher population to go crazy uh, in the state and just be overwhelmed and be eating ev everything in the state. Um, so that's why they do that. And the fur bear management uh, it helps to achieve a balance of the management of the fur bears. And this is, again, we're talking about Fisher. It's not an easy task because it's regulated trapping 
and but that does play a critical role in the balance. And some people view trapping as a controversial management technique, um, but the wildlife professionals try to improve the humaneness of the trapping through development of international standards. Now, these are the traps that are used to trap fisher. Um, and this, you can see these are kind of the catch them alive traps. Uh, obviously they dispatch the animal once they have them in the trap. But uh, in 2005, so we started uh, bringing fisher in, in 1990 in the Northwest corner. They instituted trapping in 2005 in the state of Connecticut. And we had its first, uh, first trapping season in 2005 of fisher. And this is the annual harvest of fisher in the state of Connecticut. And you can see from 2006, so that was a year after they instituted uh, trapping in the state. Uh, and you can see each year that the numbers kind of gradually ticking down to 2016 and 15, there, was a, there were about 55 fisher that were trapped by the, by the um, trappers in the state of Connecticut. Now, the other thing that's interesting is uh, about this is um, the trapping season is a very short one. It's from November 20th to December 31st. And the limit uh, is two fisher per trapper. Um, there's not a lot of people trapping these days, but uh, there, there still are some people trapping. And every fisher that is trapped must be turned into the wildlife biologists. And they do, they study the, the health of the, of the fisher. Um, and so they ask the trappers to make sure they turn the carcasses in at the pelt tagging stations that are throughout the state or to simply call the wildlife division uh, to arrange a pickup. And what they, that based upon the population that they see in the state and how the trappers are uh, monitoring it and kind of balancing that population, that determines how many fish can be trapped per year. So how do we manage fisher? Um, the following management strategies will help maintain the habitat. I talked before about how important those, lo those large trees are in the forest. But if you see very large trees on your property and they're nowhere near your homes, please leave those trees because they provide that dead that the, uh, the they, that provides the dens for the, the animals like uh, fisher, and especially use the cavities of trees to build their dens. Also, to retain and create dense forest patches of softwood and that understory cover, and also release and maintain wild apple trees. Um, a lot of places that were once apple orchards, uh, those are great places for young fisher to eat uh, in the spring and the summer. And also if you create small forest openings to enhance that vegetation, that vegetation diversity, and also that brings in more prey abundance, it brings in more squirrels and rabbits and chipmunks, and that will help the fisher population. And also another critical part is uh, the fragmentation of forest habitat is if you have fragmentation, it's not a good thing. So if we can minimize fragmentation, because what happens then is the animal will travel from one part of the forest, which is good. They cross through uh, people's yards or they go through, a, they cross highways. And then there's another habitat that's good, but that's two miles away and they, have to, and they go through a lot of danger to get there. So if you can do those things, you can help maintain the fisher population. And then the threats to fish are obviously over harvesting for pelts. Um, and if anyone wondered what a pelt is worth, a fisher pelt is uh, only worth about $30. So it's not like the people that are trapping these are making a lot of money on the, on the harvest. Um, so, but if they over harvest the pelts um, and, and then we have a loss of forest habitat due to logging or road building, that will reduce the fragment, reduced and also has a fragmentation of the fisher's range. And also what's happening with a lot of the trees in Connecticut and a lot of uh, states, the climate change is actually hurting the trees um, the acid rain is hurting things, and the more fires we have will take down some of those heavy, those big trees that are used for dens. It'll also hurt the fisher's range uh, by removing a lot of the older cavity bearing trees that they use for denning. So if you want to know more about fisher or any other animal in the state of Connecticut, I'd advise you to go to Connecticut's wildlife uh, site. And over on the left of the slide, you'll see this is a fact sheet. And this sheet uh, has information about every, this is just for Fisher, but there's a sheet made for uh, all wildlife in the state of Connecticut. And the other thing I wanted to bring to your attention is uh, the program, the, the, this education program that's been put together that I'm delivering, that the DEEP team put together 
is paid for through a tax, as an excise tax. It's called the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Program. And that was initiated in the late 1930s by sportsmen and conservationists to provide state fish and wildlife agency with funding for habitat management, research, habitat acquisition, and sportsman education programs. That, that's the word right from the, from the law itself. Now, since that act was instituted, over $14 billion has been collected and then reapportioned out to the states. So the state of Connecticut uh, gets funding um, from that. Now, the people that pay a tax on this are anyone who buys a sporting arm or handgun or ammunition or archery equipment. Um, so a lot of the people might not like hunters or people who have or, or archers, but the people that pay tax on that have, are, have been uh, contributed $14 billion to a lot of wildlife programs uh, throughout the country. And that, with that, I will open it up to any questions. Okay, well, thank you. That was very interesting. I'm sorry the videos didn't work, but maybe we'll be able to get them to work when we have the recordings. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I have a few questions here, and if anybody else has a question, please feel free to write it in the uh, Q&A, and I'll ask them. The first one is from Suzanne. Uh, she wants to know that uh, since they are crepuscular, and that is only two hours that they're active in morning and evening, what do they do in daytime and nighttime? Uh, well, the crepuscular means means that that's when they're most active, but that doesn't mean that they're not active at night because that's that's when you're, you're going to see the fisher um, covering their territories and hunting. Um, and some people uh, <coughs> if, um, will... will uh, not, not too happy about this, but the fisher will climb up into trees where the woodpeckers are living and they'll pull the woodpeckers out of the tree. So they do a lot of their hunting, but the crepuscular meaning they're, they're most active during that time, that's when you're probably going to see them. Most of us aren't out in the middle of the night in the woods. So there's a good chance if you want to see a fisher, um, you've got to get up real early or be out at late and happen to see them running through. But uh, crepuscular means that's when they're most active, but they are absolutely active at night. Okay, thank you. Well, Lucy wants to know, what is the purpose of delayed implantation? And if you could explain that word to our audience. Sure. And how does that serve the species? Uh, what, well, what that does, there's actually a lot of animals that, that are involved in delayed implantation. I, I have some information on that. Um, let's see what we have here. Uh, the fisher and also the polar bears do that. So um, one of the things that they do is a lot of times um, when they mate in the middle and toward the fall, uh, what happens is there's not a lot of food around at that time. And the same thing, with, well, I'll give you an example of the polar bear. They will, they also have delayed implantation. They will mate and then the, um, the egg doesn't go to the uterine wall until, the, until just before the time, it gives it enough time to develop and then, the, and then the, the animal is born. So it actually protects it during a time when the food is not as plentiful. And uh, so other, other animals that do that are the harbor seal and also the walrus does it. Um, but that's, that's why they do it. It's, it's to hopefully, um, if, you, if, they had, if they did not have delayed implantation and they had their young a month after they mated, um, there, there would be no apples on the trees, there'd be no acorns, there'd be no beech nuts. So Mother Nature kind of creates that window and allows them to, to have their young when, the, when all of these, um, all of the, this, this foods, these food sources are available. Okay, well, thank you for that. Now, Lucy also continues. She's a prior chicken raiser, and she often lost her chickens to what she thought were fishers, but is she falsely accusing them? Uh, no, it's it's not uncommon. I've I've uh, I've talked to people. I've given talks where the uh, fisher have climbed into uh, they actually dug under the pen of a um, a chicken pen and dragged out the uh, chicken one at a time. So they they will go after chickens. Mm, okay. And are there? Uh, Lucy also asked one more question. Are there no gray wolves left in Connecticut? What about coyotes? Do they prey on fishers? Um, the coyotes will, 
they they don't typically go after a fisher because a fisher if um the other thing i wanted to talk to you about was um the bite a, a fisher bite um, as i said before it's not a pleasant thing to see a fisher attack an animal and kill it um one of the things that the, that the uh the fisher does it has extremely strong bite um and i'll just just go over this for a second here um the biting strength of animals is usually determined by a thing called a bite force quotient. And that, that is um, the bite force over body mass formula. So just, just to get to the coyote, the coyote has a, um, a bite force quotient of 88, a black bear 64, a cougar 108, a gray wolf 136, but the weasel 164. So a fisher, generally, if it gets in a fight with a coyote, and latches onto the, the face of a coyote, the, the coyote's not gonna want anything to do with it. And they pretty much stay away from coyotes and coyotes stay away from them. Now they will go after the smaller fisher, but uh, not an adult male fisher, they, they will stay away from it. Okay, and Lori wants to know, what is the reason for the decline in the trapping? I don't know. I, I don't know that, and I, I get I gathered that slide from the, the wildlife biologists that, that track it, but um, I haven't had an opportunity to speak with them to get their thoughts on that. All right. Well, can you describe the fisher's cry? Did you hear that? Oh, I, I thought, even though I didn't get the video, I no, had to, no, oh. we we couldn't hear the cry. Okay. So, um, I'm. Richard, I'm sharing my screen right now. I did a little digging on YouTube. Um, okay. If, if you if you look on the screen, are any of these the video that you were trying to pull up? This one right here, the second one. This, the this one this one here. Yes. Fishers. Okay. Um, if you get, that will that will you'll hear, you'll hear one screaming now. Look what Tucson has. All right, just got to get rid of the video. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. That's okay. You'll go right to it. Oh, okay. You get the volume back up. That fisher just doesn't want to make any noise tonight. I know. <laughs> I even have the technical guy helping me. <laughs> <Not working. laughs> she was very calm when she arrived. She oh, there you go. Good. That's a female there. A couple of weeks, I kept her there and very quiet. And then she was moved outside into the pen you've just been into. And uh, so she was seemed very healthy. Now the male is a different story and Joy can tell the male story. The male was found in Sagamore and it was living under a uh, family's deck. Uh, the guy could actually smell the animal. That's how he knew it was out there. Um, and he trapped it so, and then he brought it here. Very emaciated, thin, scared, and covered in ticks and fleas. I mean, I've never seen, we must have taken 80 ticks one by one of this poor little animal. He was only kept inside for such a short time because he did not like being in that isolation ward in a cage. He would scream and scream and scream. Blood curdling. So that's that's it. Uh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. That's that's uh, <laughs> definitely trying to clear his throat there. <laughs> um, I'm going to continue with the questions. Um, uh, uh, let's see. You described the cry. Now William would like to know: Do fishers hunt skunks? Um, I've never heard of them eating skunks. It's not to say they don't. Um, I know they they do. Uh, um, my, my friend lives up in Granby and he says that he has a, a killing field where the, um, a fisher has killed all of the neighborhood raccoons and for some reason, uh, kills the raccoons and, and eats them in, in the same spot all the time. And he said he's gone through the woods and he's seen parts in, of, uh, of, uh, raccoons, but I've never heard of them eating skunks. 
Okay, and um, I think we sort of discussed this before, but you, we talked about do coyotes um, attack uh, fishers, but how do they interact with coyotes and bobcats? Um, is there any kind of symbiotic re relationship? Um, not, as far as I know, there, there's been uh, a study, because people will wonder, well, is the fisher eating my, my, uh, my pet cat? Well, do they, will they go after my cat? Um, the, uh, they did a study in Vermont and they found of all the, all the fishers that they studied, only one had out of a thousand had cat hair in its stomach. Um, so I think they pretty much stay away from, they will, I know they will eat the young bobcats if they can get to them before the mother uh, gets to the, the fisher. But generally the fisher and the um, coyotes will stay away from the, or the, the, the bobcat and the, the coyotes stay away from fisher because the fisher bite is so extreme that they, they don't like getting bit. And I've seen a, um, a video of a, a fairly large bobcat going after a fisher and the, uh, the, the bobcat wanted nothing to do with the fish because it got, the fisher grabbed a hold of its face and, and wouldn't let go. And if they has that kind of a, that strength of a bite force uh, on its face that the bobcat wanted nothing to do with it. Okay, so they stay away. So how many fishers are trapped by trappers annually? Realistically, do the trappers report the number of animals caught if the carcass is turned over, how do the trappers get the skins? Well, the cat, the, the trapper will skin the, the fisher first, and then they give the, the uh, carcass to the Department of Wildlife. And if for them to keep their license and not be in any violation, the laws are very strict on this. And the last number that I showed in the slide was about, I think there were about 53 fisher were trapped in, in 2015 to 16, but I, I don't have the numbers for the past couple of years. Okay, and uh, here's a question from Jan. She wants to know, are birds or bird eggs a large part of their diet or just a snack? Are there any threats to, are they a threat to the bird population? Um, I don't know if they're a, a, an overall threat. I've never seen the data on that, but I do know uh, one person uh, who lives near me said that a fisher climbed up into uh, a home or a, a, a box where a pileated woodpecker was and drag the the young out of that so um, they will go after birds if they can get them okay not so good I guess you have to watch for that so they'll come to like a bird feeder probably not because birds usually uh, will not be at the feeder at night and that's what usually when you'll see the fisher okay that's a good point um, do you have an estimate of the number of fishers in Hartford County I don't I don't okay. know what the numbers are Again, they, re they reintroduced them in 1990 mm -hmm. and they, they made their way, that was the Northwest part of the state. Um, and they, are, they came naturally into the state from the Northeast side, but I don't know. And I don't know if the wildlife department um, has an account of that because they're actually kind of tough to track and even to capture. Um, they're doing the bobcat study now. So they're getting a little bit better handle on the number of bobcat in the state, but I don't think they have a, a number on the fisher. Okay, and would Jan also wants to know, would you be more likely to see fishers or river otters along the Farmington River? Example, the People's State Forest area. Uh, you'd see mink and otters along the river. You don't, typically won't see a fisher. They, they will go along the edge of the river, but you're not gonna see them jump in the water like an otter or a mink. All right, Mary Ann wants to know, she says, one of uh, my BPD friends went on a call when they first started as an officer to see what they thought was a domestic to find out if it was a fisher doing its thing in the woods behind their house. Okay, she's sharing that to let us know that. All right, thanks, Mary Ann. Um, Jan wants to know, do they kill for fun, kill and cash when they're not hungry? I've not heard that. Um, I, I know the uh, hunting is tough for fisher because they, again, they, they have a male has a 60 square mile area. So it's, a, or I'm sorry, a 10 to 20 square mile area. That's, that's a lot of area to cover. Um, I don't imagine they're hunting for fun. They're probably hunting to eat. All right. And the last question comes from uh, Susan Barney and she wants to know, are fishers likely to be found in suburbia? I think she wanted to know how near a river or body of water do they need to live in order to survive? Um, they're kind of a, um, 
very secretive animal, but I have, uh, I, when I gave my talk in Milford, uh, people were telling me that in the Milford is not exactly uh, in the woods. It's not like the Northwest corner of the state. And they were, um, people that attended that program told me right in, in Milford on the, in the, some of the suburban areas, uh, they saw Fisher uh, climb a tree right in somebody's backyard. So they're, they're in that area. All right. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of the Bloomfield Leisure Services and the Wittenberry Land Trust. Uh, learned a lot about Fisher and we'll send out a link next week so that those who would like to see it again, or maybe we'll have the video working in there too, and you can catch it and you'll get, we'll get you the link. And just remember that coming up next month, the first Wednesday of the month, in February, February 2nd, we will be having a talk with Ginny Apple on bald eagles. Matt, you can take it away. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all. Once again, thanks everybody for coming. Um, we look forward to seeing you next month. And thanks again, Richard, uh, for that presentation. It was really great. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, everybody have Welcome. a good night. Stay safe out there. We'll see you next month. Bye, everybody. Right. Take care.